relationship. So I'm very excited to welcome you to today's conversation on the art of Christina Quarles. Los Angeles-based artist Christina Quarles creates evocative scenes that feature ambiguous figures whose torsos, limbs, and faces merge with familiar domestic objects made strange through unexpected color choices and experimental painterly gestures. Today's speakers, Kemi Adeyemi and Yuri McMillan, will explore the intersection of race, gender, and sexuality found within the intimate and expressive art of this exhibition. So I'd like to briefly introduce our um, speakers today, and then I will turn it over to them for the discussion. Kemi Adeyemi is the Assistant Professor of Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies at the University of Washington. Her book, Feels Right, Black Queer Women and the Politics of Partying in Chicago, is forthcoming from Duke University Press in September of 2022. Kemi founded and directs the Black Embodiment Studio, an arts writing incubator, public programming initiative, and publishing outlet dedicated to building discourse around contemporary Black art. She curated Catherine Simone Reynolds' 2021 solo show at Jacob Lawrence Gallery, Amina Ross's 2019 solo show at Ditch Projects, and co-curated Unstable Objects in 2017 at the Alice Gallery. Yuri McMillan is an Associate Professor of Performance Studies in the Departments of English and Gender Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. He is the author of the critically acclaimed Embodied Avatars, Genealogies of Black Feminist Art and Performance, the first cultural history of Black women's performance art in the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries. He has published additional essays as well as articles on Black diasporic artists artistic production in museums and galleries for the Studio Museum in Harlem, Aperture Foundation, MCA Chicago, and the Brooklyn Museum. He is currently working on his second monograph entitled Airbrush, Instamatics, and Funk, Art, Pop, and New York City's Long 1970s. So with that being said, thank you everyone again for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the program and I will turn it over to Kemi and Yuri. Thank you for having us. Um, hi, Yuri. Okay. <laughs> Yuri and I are going to have a conversation that kind of begins with Christina Quarles's work and uses her work um, to stage a longer conversation about how the two of us think with contemporary Black art, contemporary Black artists, how the two of us think about the intersections of race and aesthetics uh, together in our own work and in our teaching. Um, so it's, it's, it's not necessarily gonna be a session where we are you know, instructing you in, in seeing um, Christina Quarles' work. Uh, as Caroline said, please do ask us questions throughout. You can use the Q&A function. Uh, we'll kind of also keep an eye on the chat. I don't know if your chats, yeah, you, you know, so this is not a session where you need to kind of listen to us and then wait and then respond. So as um, thoughts come to you, as questions come to you, please um, let us know and we will incorporate that into our conversation. Um, should I play that video, Yuri? Or did you wanna say something before we get started? No, I think just as Camille was saying, we kind of think of this as a loose conversation, not only between the two of us, but also with the audience. So we want this to be as interactive as possible. So again, you know, feel free to use the chat to kind of say whatever comes to your mind, or if you just want to, us to answer things directly, you don't have to wait until a certain point to do that. Uh, we're going to start with just like a kind of five minute studio visit that Christina Quarles gave, um, uh, you know, I actually don't even know when, but it's just like a, a little bit of an intro into her process, into some of her thinking. We thought it would be a good just sort of like tightener for everybody in this Zoom to kind of have a little bit of a common vocabulary before we move into conversation. So I'm going to share my screen here and play this. I think a lot about how painting itself can be an interesting conceptual medium to talk about a lot of the themes in my work, dealing with identity and the body and sort of the expectations of living within a body and within a form. I try to always paint 
within a fairly short window where nothing's precious. So sometimes I'll paint like a really beautifully rendered face and then I'll be like, oh, that's not going to actually serve this painting. So I'll like, before I leave for the day, we'll do something to really mess it up. Or like sometimes I'll use a really clumsy tool because I know that I can do the gestural line fairly exacting. But if I use like a really old, awful brush, I know that I'll be forced to sort of abstract that line. So I really try to play back and forth until I get the sort of the feeling of something, like the feeling of an arm rather than the actual look of an arm. I don't start off with any sketches or any idea about what the painting's gonna be when I start it. I start off really gesturally and sort of abstractly um, and will lay down a lot of abstract brush strokes and then as that's happening, I'll try to stop myself from completing the mark and completing the form. And I'll take a step back and look at what I've made and then start to draw out the images from there. So it's kind of similar to like looking at clouds in the sky and starting to see an image forming from there. I think a lot about, I guess, intimacy and touch in the work and thinking about a fairly broad understanding of intimacy and how that is something that happens not only in like love or in sex, but it's also something that happens in sickness or violence or hunger or sleepiness. Like there's all these moments of, of intimacy where that idea of being this frontal face sort of breaks down. When we meet somebody, we concentrate on their face, but with our own selves we don't really have a clear understanding of what our face looks like but we can see like our hands and our feet interacting with space so often with these works to sort of indicate the sense of an internalized sense of self and of the world i will prioritize expression in, like the hands and the feet over the faces and the figures i always thought of art as being really just a form of language that you can use to express ideas, but I felt like I didn't really have any ideas by the time I was 18. So I decided to go to liberal arts college and study philosophy and ended up doing my dissertation in critical race theory. I ended up writing about a multiply situated racial identity. I was interested in using my own biography as somebody that is born to a white mother and a black father and who is often misseen as white, especially by white people. I was interested in sort of picking apart this idea of being mixed race. It's something that I think today is actually really present in my work and in my interests. I hope to express what it is to be in a racialized or gendered body and what that feels like to be sort of limited by how you are perceived by others and also the sense of being given certain liberties based on how you're seen by others. And so I will often use a sense of gravity or weight or a sense of being held or contained by the context of, say, a pattern plane. And I will use elements of fragmentation and containment to express the feeling I have of being within a gendered or racialized body and trying to express that range of emotional resonance throughout any one experience or circumstance. I mean, or even thinking again about the contradiction of fixed identities being used to marginalize, but then also being used as a platform to have political change or to have a sense of empowerment or a sense of community and how you can sometimes choose to fragment or fracture yourself in order to be seen or to be included or welcomed into a community and how we are constantly sort of shedding sort of this excess of our full potential in order to be social beings. Like there's this, I think, real desire to be social and to be understood
I'm just going to pull up the slides while we talk. Um, one second. I've seen that um, clip a couple of times and, and some new things kind of came up. Um, or, you know, you know, I, I was I was listening in a, in a new kind of way this time around. And one thing that really struck me uh, was, you know, as a person who's like literally not a visual artist, I have zero skills when it comes to translating an idea into images. And so I'm always kind of taken by people who can do that. And I'm not even jealous about it. I'm like, good for you. You know, we need people like you because I never, I could never. Um, but one of the things that struck me this time around was the labor of painting, the physical labor of painting and the scale at which, you know, uh, a painting is produced or the scale at which, she's producing paintings and how it requires a kind of full body um, mm -hmm. engagement and uh, how that like in very clear or sort of obvious ways is um, sort of performing or producing the theory of identity that she's sort of intellectually working through in terms of the images that she's producing um, in terms of the ways that she's thinking about identity as something that is um, done uh, and th that the doing of identity is a, um, is a, is a sort of product of um, expectation and experience. Mm -hmm. And um, I was thinking of, uh, this is getting a little bit off topic, but this person, Doriana Diaz, who's currently in the Black Embodiment Studio Arts Writing Incubator, has produced a series of t-shirts that include this quote by this artist that I cannot remember off the top of my head um, in the seventies. Um, and his quote, part of his quote was to be black is to feel it. And um, as I was watching this clip now, I was thinking about this idea of to be black is to feel it. And um, the ways that in so many ways, I think the Quarles is working through this idea of to be a particular identity is to feel it. And that the, the feeling is not only the feeling of what that might be to be Black, but the feeling of negotiating the expectations of everybody around you who, who presume that the, the doing of an identity is not actually about feeling, but about, for example, phenotype or biology. Um, I, just, I, I just threw a lot out there um, for you, Yuri, but I was kind of wondering about your kind of take, your sort of immediate takeaways when you watch that studio visit or when you look at Christina's work and, you know, the sort of the rationale for us being together in this conversation today, which is, you know, has something to do with, you know, how does Christina Quarles produce black art or not? Um, so I'm wondering like what you kind of, your immediate takeaways are when it comes to thinking about race, identity, aesthetics, and the doing and the practice of painting the practice of identity in her work. Huge. That's funny. I had a very similar um, kind of response because I thought of something very similar, but I, what I thought of was Zora Neale Hurston's, like, you know, how does it feel to be colored me? You know, just the title of that essay um, really kind of for some reason popped up this time and it hadn't popped up before when I watched this. Um, and I think for very similar reasons to what you just talked about, I was really thinking about, you know, I think that we don't often don't think about race in terms of feeling. Um, what is the feeling of what it feels like to be contained within a certain body? And like, how do you actually visually portray what that feeling is? Um, like, I think that's in some ways one way that I kind of understand how to kind of interpret this work. Um, but similar to you, I mean, I also, I had also not seen a video of actually the labor of what it looks like to actually make this work. So I think when you actually see it in person, it's very different than actually seeing what she actually has to do because even a picture like this, you know, like I'm not trained in visual art either. So it is very impressive to me that you're able to kind of present a piece like this that has multiple kind of picture planes and perspectives. You know, and I think that brought up something else that I thought of too in watching the video, which is like, you know, these kind of multiple senses of perception that I think that you're alluding to. You know, it's not only about how a subject sees themselves, but how the way that we see ourselves is also often refracted through other people's perceptions of ourselves. Um, so in some ways, you know, when I look at this video, part of the way I think about the picture planes, it's, it's also about the separation, like 
how do you visualize the line between the self and the other? Mm-hmm. And I think the way that, you know, when we think about identity, I think we often talk about identity in terms of identities that we have, but I think, you know, what the video kind of made me think of, it's like identity is really, you know, as to what you were saying earlier, our identities are really shaped by our interactions with other people. And that's kind of, you know, the way that we take in all this external stimuli and kind of figure out a way to kind of, like we're constantly negotiating that. Um, so yeah, I, I see that very much in, you know, thinking about what she's doing in this work, um, particularly because I think it's hard to kind of visualize or yeah, it's hard to visualize interiority. Like how do you actually show that to people in a visual way? And I think that's, what's actually really kind of provocative about this. Mm-hmm. And as you were talking, I made me realize I kind of wanted to take a step back because we both kind of qualified our responses as you know, I'm not an artist and I'm, I was the one who, who <laughs> you know, initiated that. Um, but I, I, w- I do think it would be useful to kind of hear you talk about how you came to be somebody who thinks with artists and who thinks about contemporary art. Um, because I also wonder if there's a longer conversation to be had about how people like us who are not necessarily trained art historians, you know, are, we have a particular skill that people invite us to like conversations like this, which is great to talk about, you know, challenging work. And so I'm kind of curious if you could just sort of talk about how you came to think with artists um, and how thinking about Black artists in particular helps you in your own kind of critical and creative practice? I stumbled onto it, to be quite honest with you. Like when I went to graduate school for my PhD, you know, I was an English undergrad, so I wasn't really thinking about art at all. Um, And I kind of really kind of just stumbled onto it in the sense that I was in a really interdisciplinary program, like an American studies and African-American studies PhD, which meant that I could take classes in pretty much any department that I wanted for the most part. So I started taking art history classes, but I still didn't think of myself as an art historian because that felt very formal to me in a way that I, I'm much a very open and dead thinker. So in some ways I, I say all this to say like, you know, there were ways that I was trained to kind of think about it, you know, in some ways, but I honestly think my training in art really was not in school. You know, I moved to New York halfway through grad school. I had a New Yorker subscription and I just started going to see art on the weekends for fun. Um, And I started doing that. I think that was kind of a training in itself. I started writing for the Studio Museum of Harlem. um, But again, that wasn't really formal to me. But what it was, was it started the kind of thing that I do now, which is like, you know, you get introduced to an artist, you talk with an artist, they give you a sense of what they bring to the work and you try to figure out a language to kind of talk about it. Um, And I think that's in some ways part of what my training came from, which I think I do now because it's still like, I think part of what I like about talking to an artist is there is that exchange, you know, it's not the kind of top down where you are putting a theory onto somebody. No, there's there's negotiation. It's a part of it's like, you know, they tell you what their intentions are about what they bring to their pieces but you as a writer are not limited by what they say, because part of it, our work as I think critics to some extent as how do we interpret the work, you know? So like, I like that kind of negotiation kind of back and forth. Um, and I think particularly when thinking about black artists, um, yeah, I think a lot of it's about the kind of expectations that people voiced on to Black artists. You know, like I think that we expect Black artists to do certain things. And I think there is still this negotiation that I think has been happening since the 70s around that, where if people don't make art that looks quote unquote Black in a prototypical way, then people are seen as doing something different. You know, so I think that's something I really try to think about, particularly, you know, for queer artists and um, people who are negotiating multiple identities in their work, um, sometimes it shows up in really blatant ways and other times it's not, you know? So I think that for me, when I think of, um, I think that artists approach their work as kind of problem solving. And I think that's a kind of more helpful way to think about it, which, which I think is different than like, you know, the art historian where everything is about 
you fit the work into a paradigm. You talk about who the work is in relationship to. And, you know, I don't like the kind of way that sometimes I think that can be limiting to people. So I try to kind of think about it in a much more expansive way. Like, you know, how many different things can we bring to how we interpret the work of artists in a very, very loose, open-ended conversational way, not in a very formal, narrow way. Um, so I'm curious with you, Kimmy, if you see the same thing. I mean, when you think about the way that you, what attracts you to fine art, or even just, you know, other expressive practices like dance, I'm curious what attracts you or compels you and how it helps you think about things. Yeah, I, want, I actually wonder if it has something to do with kind of what you said that the work of thinking with artists uh, or the work of a critic, for example, is not necessarily, or at least I think when it's being done well, it's not to kind of put a theory onto that person's work, but it's to listen closely to what that artist is saying about their practice and, you know, to flesh it out or redeploy it or communicate that to a kind of a different audience or something. Um, I think what makes thinking with artists interesting and challenging is that they themselves are already doing the theorizing. And so the challenge, the productive challenge, you know, sort of becomes, you know, like what more can I say, you know, mm -hmm. and how can what I say make the conversation even more interesting rather than, you know, you, you actually, you sort of created a little bit of a distinction that, you know, there's, there's a way to kind of approach the work as problem solving. And, um, yeah, I, I guess, what am I trying to say? What I find interesting and challenge, the problem solving for me is not solving a problem within the work, for example, but about like puzzle piecing um, that work in conversation with other things that I'm reading or conversation with other things that I'm thinking in order to kind of manifest a larger structure for thinking. And I think that it's, it's for me, it's like so... Um, engaging to be thinking with people who are producing visual materials um, because they're thinking often about similar conversations that I'm thinking about and they just have different tools and strategies that I like really rely upon mm -hmm. you know their capacities to 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 create new knowledge around ideas that we might be sharing because I think you know at, you know in my fields I'm in the gen a gender women sexuality studies department I was trained in a performance studies PhD program. I got an undergrad in um, American studies and geography. And I sort of feel like I'm constantly putting myself in conversation with people who are having the same conversation as me in a good way. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the work for me is always like, well, how can I keep my thinking interesting to myself? And what the work that visual artists do is hard for me to it's harder for me to kind of interpret than it is you know I'm you know we're so skilled at sitting down and reading a book like I could read a book you know, <laughs> um and so it, it it keeps me interested and it keeps I think hopefully ideally it keeps me interesting um and I think it's part because like I can't we can't get into like a one-up situation because we're not using the same tools and so um it kind of I think thinking with artists for me kind of strips away some of the kind of like Com petty competitiveness that can like crop up in, you know, highly trained academic circles. Um, and yeah, yeah. So that's, I think that that's kind of my first response to that um, sort of question about what, what does it, what does it do for me? And I think when it comes to Quarles's work in particular, I think, um, her own theorizing, you know, in the way that she's speaking about her work, as well as the work itself really challenges some of the um, sort of like givens or some of the taken for granted, you know, part of the conversation that we have around race and racial blackness in the fields that I'm working in, where it is for better or for worse, a pretty stabilized concept um, mm -hmm. that, there's a real reluctance, I think, around, you know, unpacking it more deeply. What, you know, whatever that means, like, I don't have even like a sense of what that would look like. But like, there, the, I think in some ways, the conversation can feel kind of stalled out. And so I appreciate 
the, the, the paintings and I appreciate her, the way that she kind of situates the broader conversations that she's trying to have that may start with a particular relation to blackness, but are about, you know, what she tried, what did she describe it as like multiply situated identities? Because I think it forces us as um, people who are also theorizing race and aesthetics to uh, shed some of our preconceived, some of our expectations for what we think of a conversation about blackness or what we think a conversation about race should be, what it should look like how it should proceed. And I wonder if part of that is because of the ways I think that she really skillfully uses kind of biography um, to talk about feeling, to talk about, you know, the intersections of race and aesthetics that she's kind of mapping out there. So yeah, that, that's just to say that like, um, I feel, per, you know, continually like productively challenged when I have to sort of take artists seriously, uh, uh, you know, or take the theories that they're using and take them seriously as knowledge that I do not have access to. And there's knowledge that I can, you know, that can help me build my own kind of critical or creative practice. No, absolutely. Um, it's funny because like some of the things you were saying, I, the puzzle pieces part, I think that's a really great way to think about it because I found... I had a very similar experience when both the quarrels, but just think in general with artists, because I think when you were talking, you reminded me like, no, I think when you talk to an artist, part of it is also about, you know, we're academics and they're artists. So even just the conversation that we have with an artist, like we have to kind of find a common ground to communicate, you know? And I think, and even like that part is actually it's fun to me because it's, 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 it's very different than the way that we're trained. You know, when you go into an artist studio and you see their environment and you see all the different things, because artist studios often have like other pieces they've made, unfinished pieces, you know, there's just all kinds of stuff in that environment. So like, you know, I think when I think about when I'm writing about an artist, the fun part is actually, it is that puzzle piece solving. It's like, you know, what, thing that I've read, can I put in conversation with this, but also, wait a minute, what was in their studio? Like, is there something in their studio that maybe they're not even aware is influence in them that mm -hmm. I see it, that I could see in the work? And like, so how do I kind of like figure out a way to kind of draw that out? Um, so yeah, I think that part of it is actually really fun. And I think particularly with quarrels, like you said, um, what I thought the work was, before I talked to her versus what I thought, what I figured out what it was after was just completely different. You know, like she talked about the work and it like, it's just like in the video and a very, um, it was theoretical, but it also wasn't. Like she just has a very particular perspective that I hadn't really heard before. So then I think the challenge for me as a writer was like, okay, so how do I explain this to people? You know, so I think, you know, that was something um, that really showed up for me. Um, but I also think, you know, a lot of it is it's world making. Like I see her paintings, each particular piece is a world, you know. So I think part of the work as critics is also kind of like, you know, delimiting what that world is, which, you know, I think a lot of it, again, it's about interiority. It's like, you know, what it feels like the world that we have inside ourselves. How do you visually portray that? Um you know, so these well, are so you you just mentioned um, you know in writing about her work. I'd ask, I, I'd like to have you talk some more about that. You sort of said you know one of the questions that you have to ask yourself then is how do I explain this to people, especially when you you know as the writer have gotten a kind of back end you know conversation and that informs then how you see the work anew and you're sort of tasked with doing the writing that is meant to kind of create a, a, a different kind of connection between the reader and the artist. Um, I'm curious about like, what, what were there kind of specific things that you felt like you had to explain or that you wanted to explain? And like, what was that act of translation that you felt like you were doing? I think the striking thing about Christina in particular was I did not see at first the race piece. You know, I had seen the work in the Hammer Museum, for instance, and I remember walking with another academic that we know, uh, 
Tavia Nyong'o, and he was saying, it's like, oh yeah, you know, this work reminds me of your work. And I remember seeing it in the museum and I just, I didn't have a reaction to it because I didn't really understand what the work was. Um, but when I spoke to her, I remember one of the things that she said was something like, you know, the, ra the race is in the work, but I think the problem or challenge is the colors that she uses do not correspond to skin color. You know, so color is used in a work to correspond to things like mood, you know, or it's like, you know, the particular time of day, like when we say like, you know, the golden hour, for instance, you know, color is being used to kind of cue those particular things, you know, so that was really interesting to me. It was like, oh, okay, you know, I think that, again, maybe I started really realizing, you know, when she was talking, I was like, okay, so I see. So it's about blackness, but it's about interiority. So how do I actually try to talk about this? And then I remember and came to me, I was like, oh, well, Kevin Kwashi's work is perfect for this. You know, so much of his work is about what black interiority actually looks like. Um, so that that's when it came kind of clear to me. It's like, I can find a way, I can use him as a kind of hinge point to kind of talk about that um, in the work and thinking about the way that, you know, pieces like this, like there's always a moment she talks about people feel like they're kind of like going like this against the frame, like they're trying to break out of the paintings. And I think that part was really interesting to me too, to kind of think about it as a kind of metaphor for wanting to break out of people's perceptions of who they think you are perhaps you know, or wanting to kind of break out of your own body, you know, so like there's like lots of different ways I think we can interpret that. But I think it was interesting because she talks so much about containment a lot, right? Like, you know, you're feeling like you're contained within your body or within your particular identities and wanting to kind of um, get out of that a little bit. And I think in some ways that really resonates with the work because I think I see that almost in all the pieces people are trying to kind of stretch beyond what their physical bodies actually can do. Um, so that part of it is really interesting to me. Uh, you know, I was also thinking about your work, Kimmy, because I think, you know, the key word that kind of jumped out to me a lot in this work is about embodiment, you know? And I was just, you know, I think every picture you're looking at, particularly limbs, like legs and arms that are really kind of outstretched. So I was wondering, what you see when you bring to the work and thinking about that with your own work? You know, it. I, I have I have a kind of dual part answer to that because I think the question about like the stretched limbs and the particular kind of color palette, I want to bookmark for you to respond to next about, you know, given your work in the 70s, which is I'm sure certainly related to, you know, the 60s, what you know how these images might kind of be evoking that time period um mm -hmm. i'm curious about that um you know i think i appreciate um in all of these paintings that sort of elongation and it's kind of grotesque um and i actually think that's what makes the work hard for me to look at like i don't find it sometimes very pleasing to look at um because it like it triggers some deep thing in me that's about you know form that isn't contained and that creates like a discomfort, like an uncanny kind of discomfort um, for me, just sort of personally looking at it. But I appreciate the length of the figures that we see because, well, first of all, it kind of refuses our expectations that the bodies that we see um, in real life and, uh, you know, in, on our screens or and on the paintings, whatever that, the art that we might looking at, be looking at it pushes beyond our expectations of sort of true figurative work that, you know, quote unquote, accurately represents so-called real life. And so there in her approach to the figure itself, she's kind of undoing or, or thinking with her untangling our expectations that a conversation about race or a conversation about blackness is, um, has to be really particularly attached to very specific embodied formations so just like the the use of color and the kind of the sense of mood that you were talking about just like the ways that that pushes against our expectations that a painting that's quote-unquote about race utilizes a kind of specific palette I think she's doing the same thing with like the you know how she's sort of producing forms that um embodied forms that uh are more flexible and so 
require us to be more flexible in our expectations that we're bringing to the viewing experience. Um, yeah, that's kind of that's that's kind of like pops up for me. Um, I'm going to read Matt Offenbacher has a, a question in the Q&A that um, I'm just going to pull out just because um, I really like the way Quarles was talking about ideas of intimacy in her work and all the different kinds of intimacy. It made me think about tensions between vulnerability and self-protection, especially moments when identities inform exchanges between people. Kemi and Yuri, do you think intimacy plays a role in your own work in some way too? Wow, that's a hard question. I mean, yes. <laughs> yeah, you know, yes, it does. But I think, you know, maybe it's because I think that I don't always frame it as intimacy, although it definitely is, because I think so much of the work that I do is about friendship and love. Um, I've been thinking about that a lot lately. Mm. So I think intimacy is definitely part of it. I mean, I think I mean, it's just, it's a matter of language, but yes. I mean, I think I think so much about the way that artists, artists' friendships and romantic relationships with each other often become a catalyst for the kind of work that they make. Um, so I think for me, I think of it as trying to challenge the idea of solo authorship that we have around so much artistic work. Um, and to say that actually people make stuff in community with each other, and that's the way we should see the work. Um, but I appreciate that question because I guess, you know, I hadn't thought of that in relationship to this, but, you know, she did talk about community, um, in, you know, the video that we watched. So, yeah, I think there's a way to actually think about that kind of being in the work itself as well, you know, about the way that, you know, identity is structured through being in community with people, you know, so part of it's about, you know, the way that you see yourself, but it's also about the way that other people, can help shape you both in positive and negative ways. Um, and to kind of think about that, to think of also think of friendship as a form of intimacy, um, which I think is not usually always the way that we think about it. I think sometimes we, th we separate sexual intimacy versus friendship, but I think if we think of intimacy as a much kind of broader concept, and I think, yeah, there's absolutely a way we can see it um, in here, especially even like a piece like this. Yeah, I was, yeah, this is sort of a fortuitous slide uh, to kind of build off of, you know, I think when I first was reading your question, Matt, I was like, no, <laughs> like, <laughs> uh-uh. Um, and I, I, that's a knee-jerk re response that's, you know, much more personal, I think, than like the writing that I'm producing. But I think, I think one way that I think about intimacy or how that plays a role in my work. I think about it probably most um, directly when I'm thinking about what it means to write about black artists. And I'm thinking about how can my writing about black artists or how can my conversations with black artists be rooted in an intimacy that is um, actually a kind of a gateway to like creating ethical and just relations between me and the person I'm writing on so that my writing doesn't feel extractive, for example, or so that I don't feel like um, I'm redeploying their work for a kind of personal narcissistic end or something. So I, I think about intimacy as the mechanism of of being in conversation with an artist and, and so that our, our kind of mutual or shared outcome is realized, whatever that may be. And so that's kind of one way I think I think about it. And then my sort of knee jerk, no reaction has more to do, I think with something like that's being produced in this image that we're seeing, which is that I think for quarrels um, and for me, I think, you know, the, the, the conversation is about the fact that intimacy and vulnerability, as you said, is actually really kind of gross and messy and requires a lot of forms of contact that are kind of where we cannot be distinguished, you know, we cannot distinguish ourselves from the person next to us, and that that requires an extreme amount of vul vulnerability to attain. Um, and then the flip side is that when it happens, it can be really alienating, you know, to have given yourself over to a person or a community or an idea or a way of feeling or a way of moving. And so I appreciate the kind of visual visualization of that, that we get even in this particular painting, that um, the 
intermingling and the exchanges of forms that we see here are certainly um, intimate and they're also a kind of um, metaphor for the those very challenges of intimacy and you know the, the yes I guess I'll just sort of stop it there with those, those very challenges of intimacy so like yeah no the answer is yes the answer is no um <laughs> <laughs> I like but some also just to say. point out something uh, to add to that, you, your comment also made me think, I mean, if we were look at a picture like this, what's also provocative about that question is it's not really clear here if this intimacy that's being portrayed is pleasurable or if it's violent. You know, mm -hmm. I think there's not a really clear cut answer to that question. And I think I'm glad that Matt asked this question because I think in relationship to this work, it made me realize that it's really, um, it's ambiguous, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, one, I wonder if that, like, that ambiguity is what makes Quarles' work challenging for me. Um, and one of the questions I had wanted to offer or to ask you was, is, you know, what what are the sort of pressure points in her work that are challenging for you and challenging can be like a good thing like they either either that you struggle to kind of apprehend or the things that are challenging that help you you know push your own thinking further I mean the first word just knee jerk reaction I think is opaqueness um the work doesn't open out in the way that I think we particularly but black artists would want the work to open out. I think it's kind of, it's withheld in a way, you know? And I think, you know, understanding what the intentions are behind it for Quarles, I think that helps it make sense. But I think, you know, when you see the work in the museum for the first time and you don't, you know, you don't read the wall text, for instance, or you haven't read, you know, the book or anything like that, and you just see it, um, it's hard because you see and like the knee jerk reaction to it is not going to be the same thing once you know all the intentionality behind it. So I think that's the part that I find, I do find challenging. I think even knowing all this stuff now, I think, like you said, there's certain pieces where it can be really jarring to your expectations of what you want a queer artist or a black artist, what you want their work to look like. Um, so I think in some ways, maybe because it is very representational, um, but it's also really abstract, you know, like I think, and it toggles between both of them so much that I think there are interesting things to look at for sure. Like there, I love all the color that Quarles uses and I love the play with different patterns. Like, you know, when I talked to her, I started noticing things like, you know, the grass in this piece was something I might not necessarily notice until I spoke to her. So I like that kind of, tactile quality to the work. I like, I love that part of it. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, meaning making is hard. And I think it's hard as a viewer not to want things to mean immediately. Mm -hmm. that, if that makes sense, you know? Yeah. yeah. Like, I think that's a thing I've been trying to um, wrestle with lately. It's like, for instance, like, you know, when I go into museums and see shows now, I often purposely now, I don't read the wall text because I just want to see what my reaction is to the work. Like, I don't want to be told what the work is about per se. And then I want to kind of see after I view the work, if I want to read the text and kind of negotiate those two things together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like how you described it as the work is sometimes feeling withheld and how that um, slows us down in our kind of desire to kind of immediately understand a work. And then the, something like the wall text can do a lot to sort of quote unquote, make us understand the work. And so it's interesting to kind of refuse to do some of the ancillary reading in order to enter into a work that feels withheld. Um, I like that word withheld kind of more than uh, opaque in some respects, because I think the language of withheld feels agentive in a way that I think is precisely what she's kind of working through or, or talking about, you know, the ways that, you know, our, our, our interior sensibilities, of course, our, are ours. And sometimes the only strategy I might have is to withhold some of myself for myself. 
Um, and so when you said that word withheld, I was actually thinking about um, the drawings. And I think we have uh, the drawings that were on view that actually for me were the set of images that really helped things click for me for some reason. And I'm not really sure. I think, um, I think I get lost in the color and the pattern in a way that makes my mind wander in a, in a, in a way that feels good, but something about the drawings just sort of returned me to the fact of the material at hand. And, um, I don't know if I have anything more to say ab about that than that, that I was really, and remain really compelled by the drawings and not in the sense that they are stripped, you know, back or anything like that. Um, but I think something about the frankness of drawing itself, um, maybe felt a little less withheld than the paintings. And I don't say that to say that, you know, I need, I need the artist to be fully available to me <laughs> or I need the paintings to be fully available to me, but it was a kind of um, nice sort of like rounding out, I think of some of the more, you know, kind of, uh, I, I wanna use the word vibrant for lack of a better word work that, that's also on display there. Maybe it's because what I just noticed is the drawings are, there's humor in the work, but the humor comes through more in the drawings than they do in the paintings. Yeah, I think that's a good, I think that's a good way to, to think about it. And I wonder if the humor that maybe we can interpret more in the drawings has something to do with, you know, a kind of history of cartooning in the United States where the, the, the simple line drawing is the vehicle for, for um, expressing the joke. And I think that, you know, at least for me, when I'm, when I'm being like confronted with a lot of color, it actually makes me turn more inward because then I'm having all of the associations with the color and the patterning, patterning rather, um, that allows me to kind of shut down maybe some of the rest of what might be happening in the visual field. You know, and I think, so I think, you know, we, we, Part of the conversation was like, what are what are the things that challenge us about the work and challenge us to think harder and think deeper? I think for me in approaching um, Christina's work, it does force me to kind of slow down and look at it in a different way than I might typically in another show that I feel like, oh, let me just breeze through this and mm -hmm. I'll be able to kind of contemplate it later. I feel like there's so much happening that I actually have to contemplate it now. And that actually can be the discomforting point for me. Like, I actually don't wanna <laughs> be with my thoughts. Like, this is too intimate or this is too intense. And I, um, you know, I, I wanna be visually stimulated so that my brain empties, not so that you're filling it up. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so you're, she is being like, fill up your brain. And I'm like, God, uh, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Absolutely. And I, because it also makes me think about something else. It's like, I think part of it is like painting is such a fraught medium. It's like when you see a painting, it's almost like you're confronted with the whole history of painting and the way that, like, you know, Black folks have really had a really fraught relationship with that field. You mm -hmm. know, so I could definitely see what you're saying with the, with the drawings. They feel more improvisational mm -hmm. than the paintings do. Mm -hmm. um there's a question here are there other artists historical or contemporary that you see quarrels as in dialogue with uh oh we have the art historian uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> the art historian is putting us on in the hot seat you know to be honest it's a hard question for me to answer because i just don't I think with other artists, it's really easy to do that. To do that, I think with Quarles, it's hard, you know, because I think of her work as so singular in a way that's hard for me to think about who to put her in conversation with. I'd have to think about it. I mean, are people coming to jump out to you? Well, no, I was actually going to think more, uh, less about specific artists because whenever I like have a terrible like Rolodex brain, I can I, I I have bad recall. Um, but I think in, when I think about like whose work is her work in conversation with, um, I actually think less comparatively and more about whose work or what fields of producing work is she asking us to like challenge and push forward in a certain kind of way. So, you know, I think right now in kind of art, 
critical dialogue. We're really captivated by representation versus abstraction. And we're really captivated by black artists who are working in abstraction. And, and that's a good captivation to have. Um, but I think that her work is really kind of asking us to slow down a little bit and say, well, there, you know, what happens when we think about those two genres of working in closer conversation or what happens when we think about them happening, you know, together in the same field? Like how can we take a history of black figurative work and put it in conversation with a history of um, people working in black, black artists working abstractly. And how can we think about a, a future of art, black arts production where the artist does not have to choose between one of those, one or the other uh, in order to define their practice and specifically in order to define their practice, you know, for a, an art market that, you know, it's whims kind of change all of the time. So I think that it's almost like she's in dialogue with the dialogue around black art and around contemporary painting itself uh, in a way that I appreciate because um, it's, it just feels kind of really solid uh, for lack of a better word. And I'm sure that, you know, if we like were able to, we would be able to like write down a list of <laughs> artists mm -hmm. on the fly. We'll, we'll email you after um, with, with particular artists on the fly, but that's, for me, I'm really thinking about it in terms of uh, how she's staging a conversation with a conversation around Black art and artists that for me feels really kind of interesting and generative. Yeah, I mean, I think if I, as I was thinking about it, I mean, Genevieve Gennard does come up as somebody who is also negotiating um, mm -hmm. being a Black person who is often seen as passing. You know, I do think there's a relationship there. I think they do it in very different ways because Genevieve shows up in all of her work mm -hmm. um, and she does a lot of persona plays. So I think, you know, they're both, it's interesting, they're both in that dialogue, but they, you know, Genevieve primarily does photography to kind of get at that question. I think someone who's also tangentially related, like I could see like a Jonathan Landon Chase only in a sense that I think the relationship between the paintings versus his drawings, I think there's something similar, you know, where I think that some people, some artists use their drawings as a looser, playful way to get at some of the themes that they engage in more formally with their paintings. I think there could be a way to kind of think of that relationship there. But again, you know, like, you know, as you were saying, like a kind of like one-to-one, -one, these are the four people who, this is her cohort specifically. You know, I just think that Quarles kind of refuses that, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And I, in some ways I kind of like, I like that about the work, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that question. And also just a reminder, to folks, um, we have like 15-ish minutes. So, you know, please do uh, drop questions into the chat or drop questions into the Q&A um, as, as we keep kind of having this conversation. Uh, you know, Camille, you made me think of something else um, in relationship to what you were talking about, the abstraction versus um, figuration. I just remember in this, this New York Times interview I read recently with Antoine Sargent, and he was saying something about the way that there is so much attention on Black really obscuring that there's other Black artists who are doing work that is not so figuratively based, but the art market, that is what people want right now. Mm -hmm. So it's done this thing where it's created this like flattening of what the category of Black art looks like. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so like, I really am thinking about that with this because what I like about Quarles is like, you know, there is figuration there, but again, it is not the figuration that I think that, you know, Sargent is alluding to, which I think is very much, you know, classical figuration, which is so much focused on the face, you know, like, you know, that kind of painting that we all kind of recognize like portraiture, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like, it's interesting because I think there are remnants of that in this work, but it's really not. Like, I like what Quirrell's really said in the video about, you know, like, I'm not really trying to fuck with the face, you know? Like, I'm gonna give you hands, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you feet and maybe some legs, but I'm not gonna do the like, the like one-on-one, -on -one, your viewer looking at someone's face directly that I think we associate so much with painting. Mm -hmm. um, so that part about it, I really, you know, I really appreciate about the work. Mm -hmm. 
Well, and I think that when we think about figurative work, um, like a portrait painting, for example, it's produced. So the viewer is apprehending the full body of the person who's kind of on the canvas. And she describes, you know, that the extremities that she's painting are the extremities that we see. We see, we, we don't see our own face necessarily all of the time, but we see our hands and we see our feet. And so elongating those appendages um, to kind of highlight the perspective of the painting itself, which is from the person who's bearing those arms, bearing those limbs. And I think when we think about that language of withholding, what that does is intervene into that kind of history of portraiture, which is for the viewer to witness, for the viewer to purchase and put in their home. And the intimacy, I think, that's that these particular canvases invite in is, is actually about entering into um, whether we want to think about it as the painter's mind or the mind of the, the figures that we're looking at. Like it's a, we're it's like a different game altogether that we're talking about in terms of what does it mean to put a body, you know, on view, let alone to purchase, you know, at the latest art fair or something like that. And so I'd be curious, like, in a like much more different kind of administrative conversation to think about how her work sells vis-a-vis -vis how a, a kind of more classically organized, you know, portrait painters work sells and what people's appetite for what the art market's appetite for uh, air quotes, black painting looks like when it's not somebody who is necessarily um, sort of stereotypically, phenotypically black on, 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 you know, on the canvas and like literally phenotypic, like the body, you know, wh what we expect a body to look like, like is being played with in, in Quarles's work kind of at all levels. And I think that that in and of itself really intervenes into maybe even what you were asking, like intervenes into like who we might see this painter in dialogue with because the very conversation around like what is the black body to be viewed you know that very conversation is is kind of related certainly but you know different kind of scope and scale mm -hmm. are there other questions you guys have you want to drop in the chat they could be really loose they don't have to be anything formal mm -hmm. Yeah, I think in relationship to my work too, I've been thinking about color theory. You know, color, color theory versus color in terms of race and thinking about the ways that those intersect and then the ways that they don't. Um, so I think that's something I've been thinking about with the work in the 70s and I'm also seeing a relationship to this. Um, you know, because I think there's just a way that I've been thinking about some of the people I've been writing about and when people use color like really bright, vibrant color, you know, people interpret it as somehow emblematic of like the quote unquote gaiety of black life, mm. you know? So I think there's something, you know, I don't, it's tangential to this, but it's making me think of this because I think there's also something about what happens when a black person uses color, but maybe they don't use color in the way that we expect them to use it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the slide that we're looking at is an install shot um, at MCA, right? No, this is, the install shot at the Fry. Now I can't remember because I saw it yep. at the MCA as well. It's at the Fry. It is the Fry. Yep. Yeah. And one of the most striking things to me, uh, having seen the show at the MCA when it was just sort of classic white wall and then walking in and seeing this installation, I was really, you know, I, I was really um, struck by the, the sort of vibrancy of the color and it, produces I think just because of the color choice of course produces a sense of play that wasn't necessarily palpable to me you know when I had seen the show first in Chicago and I think even like in this conversation that word kind of play doesn't really hasn't really come up and I wonder to what mm -hmm. extent you think about her work in conversation with the word play or not 
Um, yeah, you're right. It's actually, I'm surprised that that hasn't come up, but, oh, absolutely. I mean, her work, there's so much play in the work. I mean, I love that about the work actually. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, it's hard to say more than that, but I think that even with an image like this, I think the way that um, she's playing with scale and also playing with like, you know, what's in the foreground versus what isn't, you know? So I do love the way that I think what I see in an image like this, and I didn't get to see this at the fry, but I love that she's almost kind of forcing the viewer to navigate the work in a particular way. So I think when you talked about making people having to slow down, you know, I think even staging the work in this way, um, where like there's some things that are right in front of you and they're like, you have to kind of like move, you have to move your body in a particular way, kind of almost around the work. Um, That's something I'm noticing, but I also think color too, because, you know, color, you know, it's, it's very sensorial. Like our experience of color is very particular to each of us. And there is a way that I think you can be taught about all kinds of art historical theories, but the way that you perceive color is something that, you can't necessarily be trained in it. It's something you just have. And I think I really appreciate that about even like, you know, seeing an installation shot like this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have a question for you and there's a question for you in the chat, but I'm I'm gonna preempt it and and steal a question. You know, I think one of the things about the color, you know, you you were talking about color theory and I've been thinking about your, your work and your new work on the 1970s. And I think one of the reasons that maybe the word play doesn't necessarily stick in my mind when I think about her work is because I, I, I often, I think I really see it as like very psychedelic, not mm. that like taking psychedelics isn't fun or playful, but it, um, I just, yeah, I guess I just want to put that out there and sort of ask you what resonances, if at all, um, how, how psychedelics might play into the work for you, like just literally as a viewer and as somebody who's also spent time writing, you know, about her work. You know, it's funny you said that because I actually was thinking something very similar around that, which is that, you know, the people that I've been writing about took psychedelics and their experiences with psychedelic drugs is actually, I think there's a relationship between that and the really strong colors that they use. Um, so yeah, I think there is, there is definitely a relationship between that for sure. You know, that I think that people are kind of using it as a way to get viewers to enter in, into an aesthetic dimension, but almost kind of like tricking them to get into that aesthetic dimension. So I think there is a way that, yeah, I definitely see that with the works. I think of so much of the work is about mood and temporality that I think color almost becomes the access point to get viewers into that alternative realm. Um, for sure. So mm-hmm. that's a good point. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. But now that like, you know, looking at the slides, there's just so much in a way that the color is like very reminiscent of that. And even the use of pattern, like the patterns are very vibrant, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, let's turn our attention to prob- maybe one of the last questions of the afternoon, which is, can you share a bit about your writing process for the article that you wrote for the exhibition catalog or your approach to engaging with art and writing more generally? My writing process for the article. Um, one of them was that it was really short, you know, so that's a challenge, you know, as academics, we can be a little bit lengthy in our thoughts. Mm-hmm. Um, I think also when you're writing for a museum, you don't write in the same way. Um, I think academic writing can be really, um, what's the word? You know, it's like you have to always you can't just ever really say something. It's always like, you have to always say these 10 people said this thing first. And I think with art writing, which really, I find really refreshing about it is you don't have to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, your toolkit can be a little bit different. Your writing can be looser. Um, so yeah, when I was writing about her, you know, when I got the invitation, um, I remember, I remember, I think her studio is in Echo Park. So I remember going there It was actually the studio that you saw in the video at the beginning of this presentation. That's literally the studio that I went to. And, um, you know, it's it's very similar to what you said, Kimmy. It's like, you know, we talked, I took notes. Um, But the process of really thinking about what to say, it was not in the studio. It was really like, I had to really go back and I had to sit with 
what I had saw and what she had told me. And I had to kind of figure out how to communicate it because I understood what she was saying when she was talking to me. And she said a lot of the things that she said in the video in that particular way, but it was as someone who writes about art. I can definitely just be vulnerable and say that her essay was probably very different than the writing I usually do, because it was really the first time that I had to take an artist and actually, I had to really think, I had to create a language to talk about the work. And I usually, it's not difficult to do that with other people, but with Christina in particular, I couldn't really rely on any of the other things that I had written. Her piece had to be so different because what she was saying about race was so different than anybody else I had talked to that I had to really sit with it for a while. Um, but I think with um, my approach in general, um, I mean, it, it's kind of intuition to be honest with you. I feel like when I, I approach writing like problem solving. So I think even with this piece, you know, I don't always know what I'm going to say about an artist. I kind of have a hunch of what I think I might want to do. And then I write it. The writing becomes a way to kind of figure out what it is. And it's like, you know, I don't know if you work like this too, Kimmy, but oftentimes like, I don't know until the very end of something like, oh, that's what I've been trying to say all this time. Mm -hmm. You know, so it felt very similar to how I approach art in general, which is, um, I put, think of myself as, okay, like I'm the interpreter. So it's not about what I think per se. I'm trying to translate what the artist told me and then translate it in a way and then project it out to the public. So I kind of see myself being more as like the medium mm -hmm. uh, between the artist and the public. And that's in some ways what I tell some of these artists sometimes mm -hmm. that, um, you know, I'm not trying to, like you said earlier, Kim, it's like, I'm not trying to use the writing to elevate myself. Like I'm trying to use the writing to elevate you. So like, tell me what you want to go into the writing and what your intentions are. And like, I will find a way to kind of craft the language to put it back out. Um, so yeah, I kind of really just think of myself as more kind of like the conduit um, versus, you know, the person writing who's somehow trying to like, you know, use the writing to kind of elevate myself as, you know, like an academic, you know, I just think that's kind of like a nasty approach to look at art writing. Um, so yeah, I just really try to use writing as to be, yeah, it's like an, as open-ended as possible. Um, and also to ask questions that not, might not necessarily have to be answered. You know, I think a lot of art's about provocation. I don't think it's about having clear cut meanings or answers to the questions. I think it's more interesting when you don't necessarily know what something's about, you know? I think that's a good kind of point. Like I think art writing for me, also feels like problem solving, but where the, the problem doesn't necessarily have to be solved. Like, I feel like I can ask kind of more open-ended questions that I'm like kind of allowed to ask in the academic publishing industry where it does have to, you know, tie up uh, at the end to be valuable in a certain kind of way. And I think that's also what makes it challenging for me when I am in conversation with the artist that I, that I am then writing about because I'm like you are why why am I writing this like you literally already said it <laughs> like I don't need to you know so that that becomes the, that's where for me where that like kind of problem solving comes in okay then what mm -hmm. what can I say what do I have to say that can pitch what you've already so clearly articulated, you know, toward a kind of different audience or, or a different kind of end. And that's what makes it, you know, interesting, engaging to keep writing with artists and kind of get out of my own mind, get out of our own minds and, and you know, be of use and be of service to other people. <laughs> Best case Absolutely. scenario. Absolutely. Um, Yuri, thank you so much for being in conversation with me this afternoon. Thank you, Kemi. I got me a lot to work with. <laughs> Thank you to all of you who, who joined up and, and sat with us this afternoon. Um, yeah, Carolyn, are you going to have a little, a little goodbye? A very brief one. I just wanted to thank you so much. Um, I even was taking notes and I've been looking at her work for a long time and it was a very thoughtful and enlightening conversation. And so I just want to say thank you for your time. Thank you to everyone that joined us today.